But here's what Hunter called mama. Oh my goodness. Cover your eyes, my friends. Hunter called stepmom Jill a vindictive moron and an entitled C word. Marco Polo is responsible for publishing a dossier, a tremendous dossier, on the Biden crime family that has yet to have one fact unproven. I'm not aware of a single one. The witness list, the way we read it, shows Hunter Biden's ex-wife next on the list. Below her, the widow of his late brother, Beau Biden. That's Hallie Biden, the woman with whom he also had a romantic relationship. Hunter Biden called Jill Biden some nasty names. We're going to see exactly what those were and then ask ourselves, what was she doing there supporting a son who was so disrespectful to her? Well, apparently she loves him, loves him dearly, and definitely doesn't want him to be convicted of these crimes that might implicate her entire family. So she's showing up and she's giving jurors the old stink eye one by one, just looking at him. Oh, because this is their backyard. They put this trial right where it serves them best. They put Trump in the most liberal county. 83% of the people voted for Alvin Bragg, who ran it on getting Trump. But back here in Delaware, Joe Biden's been in power for, oh, 30 years plus. Then he was the vice president. Now he's the president. So they've got a lot of power here. So she showed up again for the second day to support old Hunty because they love their son so much. Mm hmm. And here was the scene as she was walking in. Secret Service, front and back, outside in Delaware. Case has already been rigged, by the way. From the beginning, this was something that Hunter should have been charged with a lot more crimes than this. Essentially, it's a jaywalking ticket. And I agree, the charges are even ridiculous. But the only reason we're at trial is because they gave him a ridiculous charge plea deal. It was a slap on the wrist plea deal. Just take his stupid little deal for this little uh, gun charge that no one ever cares about, no one even thinks about. And he rejected that. So that's the only option really for the government to go to trial on. They said, okay, I guess, well, if you're rejecting it, we have to go to trial on it. And so that's why we're here. It was already rigged and now we're going to trial on it because it wasn't good enough for Hunter. So now we know that as this is all unfolding, there's new stories leaking and there's confirmations that the laptop is true, but here's what Hunter called mama. Oh my goodness. Cover your eyes, my friends. Hunter called stepmom Jill a vindictive moron and an entitled C word. Oh my goodness. In vicious texts. Wow. So what's she doing there? Is this a loving family or is this just kind of a criminal organization cover up bracket. Wow. So he called her a vindictive moron, which might be true. I don't know. And an entitled C word. Also, I mean, I don't know. She might be entitled. I don't know. In a series of text messages after she urged him to go to rehab to deal with his drug addiction. Golly. So Hunter, the president's scandal ridden son, branded his mother a vindictive moron and an entitled C word. This has now come to light. 2018 text messages. The 54 year old troubled son allegedly launched a venomous tirade against his stepmother after she encouraged him to get help. He's like, can you just stop smoking crack all the time? He's like, you're a C. In a particular exchange with his late brother Bo's widow, Hallie Biden, who he dated. So his brother drops dad. He's like, hey, baby, what's up? Hey, are you grieving your dead husband, my brother? Well, you know who's just like him? Me. So let's say we get some dinner. Who was in a controversial relationship with Hunter at the time? Hunter does not mince words about the now incumbent first lady. He says, F my stepmother for always being as much of a selfish, silly, entitled C as you. He vented to Hallie amid the breakup of their brief relationship. Oh no. He confessed to bulking out another insult laden text to his uncle James Biden. He referred to Dr. Jill Biden as an effing moron, a vindictive moron. And we've seen her speak. She's not that bright. She talks about bodegas and Hispanics are like tacos or something. What was that at that thing that time? Further probing text messages with his uncle revealed Hunter bragged that he was intellectually superior to his stepmother. He's like, I'm smarter than you anyways, you see? And he says to her, and you do know the drunkest I've ever been is still smarter than you could ever even comprehend. And you're a shut gram. <laughs> but I think you know what he means there. You're a shut grammar teacher that wouldn't survive one class in an Ivy graduate program, he wrote. Well, that's brutal, man. That's brutal. So he's telling his own mama, stepmom, I guess, that your education is stupid. Now, we all kind of make fun of her for being a so-called doctor because they try to make her into something. <laughs> that's been our opinion. It's like, she's not a real doctor, you know. This is all just a fake charade. She 
she just pretends that she's a doctor or has some education doctorate or something like that. And they put her on the view like, hi, doctor, how was your brain surgery last night? And she's like, oh, it's just great. You know, I was in there for 15 hours again, saving lives. Like, oh yeah, that's amazing. So now even Hunter thinks this is stupid that she doesn't, yeah, doctor, you're a grammar school teacher and your grammar's not even great. You can't even pronounce Bodega, 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 Bodega. So he says, go F yourself, Jill. Let's all agree. I don't like you any more than you like me. And in another successive text, Hunter griped to his uncle about the apparent absence of his father, Joe. He says, where's my daddy at? Where's my daddy? He says, literally, has never come to one, never actually called me while in rehab. My daddy doesn't even care about me. I'm a 50 year old man in rehab. Where's my father? He says, so that's a little insane. Maybe if he loved me, I wouldn't be here. The text messages were uncovered on an iPhone that was found backed up on Hunter's laptop from hell. It comes as the first lady attended the federal gun trial of her stepson. And what a nice family, huh? Well, Jill Biden is kind of a moron and she does seem vindictive. And so the person who has really brought a lot of this to our attention, of course, is our friend Garrett Ziegler. You know him. But check this out, man. He got attacked there today by this lunatic family. He's out there reporting. And, you know, it's shocking to me. I mean, if this were a judge or if this were Angeron's girlfriend or Greenfield or whatever, maybe the FBI would be on this case, but they're not because it's Marco Polo USA and because the scoundrel here is the Biden crime family. So is allowed. This type of misconduct's allowed. Here's the story. The background is from Wendell Husibo, who reports over for Breitbart, tells us, oh, he's also a Hunter Biden art critic. We do a little art critiquing here ourselves. Of course, we've been following the Hunter Biden paintings for a long time, and we remember his mucus COVID painting back from the COVID era when he was on crack before they hired a ghost painter or wherever those paintings are coming from. But Wendell reported this, he says, unhinged Hunter Biden's wife, Melissa Cohen Biden, relation to Michael Cohen, I have no idea, verbally assaults founder of Marco Polo USA, Garrett Ziegler at Hunter's trial. Verbally assault, hit him. Can you believe this? Marco Polo is responsible for publishing a dossier, a tremendous dossier, on the Biden crime family that has yet to have one fact unproven. I'm not aware of a single one. So Melissa got close to him, pointed her finger at Garrett right in his face and shouted, you have no right to be here, you Nazi piece of crap. And then she turned and walked away. Ziegler, who's an absolute rock and a gentleman, did not respond to her. Stood there, stoic, nonplus, unfazed. Ziegler told NBC News, he said, you know, for the record, I'm not a Nazi. I'm a believer in the US Constitution. I haven't said one thing to them. Gentlemen, class act right there, Garrett Ziegler. You know where to find him, but if you don't, here's the location at Marco Polo 501c3 on X. He says, you know, strange times here. He says the wife has the same level of impulse control as Hunter. They're great for one another. Says to the family, bringing decency back, which is Hunter, anyone who is perceived as opposition is a Nazi. Yes, truly contemptible liars and scoundrels. We don't respond in kind in the back of a courtroom because we're gentlemen who do not berate women. Classy, classy, classy organization over there. Outstanding. We want to be like Marco Polo, Garrett Ziegler, and not be like Melissa Cohen, an unhinged lunatic verbally assaulting independent journalists who are investigating the truth and who love the Constitution. All right, so that is what's happening there. Now, simultaneously to all this nonsense going on and verbal assaults on our friends, we also have the DOJ that's responding to Hunter's request to object to certain exhibits as evidence. And so yesterday on the show, in a prior video, video. Remember that Hunter objected to a bunch of stuff coming in. His audio, his videos, his text messages. He says, you don't need to see my wiener flopping all over the place next to a pound of crack, all right? You don't need to see all of these crack pipes with residue and scales all over the place. It's enough. It's too prejudicial. It's not probative. It doesn't help the case in any way, shape, or form. And so he submitted a big list of things that he wants to keep out. Well, the government just responded and says, no, how about no? Here are our responses to Hunter's objections at trial. It says, for the reasons, here's why all of these objections should be overruled. Let's just take a look at some of them before we jump into the day's activities. They tell us that, all right, Hunter objects to these text messages in our summary chart. He says they're cumulative, but not really. They say, no, the redacted message in row 215, here's what it says. It says, that's a line brighter than throwing my gun in a full trash can in a busy grocery store, and then some kid blows his sister heads off, and you go to prison for the rest of your life. They say, oh no, 
that's coming in. All right. Hunter said that. Hunter said, you know, don't cross the line. He's texting somebody about it. He's like, well, I didn't cross the line like you did of, you know, stealing my gun, throwing it into a grocery store. So some kid shoots his sister. They say, yeah, we want that admitted because that's an admission about the gun. And it's a statement made by Hunter to the defendant, to witness number three. And so it's admissible as an admission. This is why you don't want to make admissions or really talk about the case at all because they just interpret everything as an admission. They say it's used against you and it's admissible against you. Now, with respect to these other rows, they say, no, that we need to get all these other messages in as well. It's all probative of his active addiction. For example, they say, look, let's look to chapter 11 of his book. He admitted in his book that he was actively addicted to crack, crack cocaine between 2015 and 2019. Four years, he wrote it in there. The government's motion, we included it there. And also these other rows are also relevant because they also match. They say his addiction continued into 2019 without disruption. They only sobered him up, so-called, because daddy was running for president. They needed to figure this out. Now the messages have a tendency to make the fact that he was an addict and a user more probable than without the messages. So it's probative because it helps us come to a determination. And in addition to that, the government says, the fact that he was addicted to crack between the fall of 2016 and the spring of 2019 is also a fact consequence that's relevant to everything. And his admissions in his messages have probative value, which is not outweighed by the danger of unfair prejudice. And remember, we have the balancing test. Is it more harmful than it is helpful? Is it more probative than it is prejudicial? We weigh it and decide. Now here, 18C, they really don't want this wiener video floating around out there. They say, okay, Hunter objected to this video from December 2018 under rules 401 and 403. That's the balancing test. Why? Because Hunter is naked. They say, oh no. And now he doesn't want the jurors to see it. So they say, wait a minute. No, they say we redacted this clip. All right. We actually redacted his wiener. So the jurors don't have to see it because the prosecutor's like, we don't want to cause them PTSD. The government took a sampling of a few images from Hunter's devices as evidence in this case. And so therefore the images are not cumulative. Now, as with the text messages, this video is evidence of the ongoing and long running addiction where he admits to that in the same period of time. It's also admissible under these rules because it makes it more probable than not that they can make a determination based on this video. Similarly, they don't want to use this December 2018 video or maybe another one in 18D, another video, because it's after the gun purchase. They say, no, this video is after the purchase, so you don't need that. And he says, the voice is not even Hunter's anyways. They say, no, sorry, Hunter. The government says that this video of Hunter, oh, here's what's in the video, weighing white powder on a scale shows Hunter's period of addiction. It lasted for four years. He's dropping crack cocaine on scales, including the time period during which he purchased the gun all the way into 2019. With respect to whether the sound on the video is Hunter's voice, it clearly is, and the jurors will be able to identify the voice for themselves as they will hear other exhibits in which Hunter reads portions of his book. Hunter also wanted 18E thrown out. They say no. This photograph is evidence of the accuracy of his active addiction. It lasted for four years. It continued all the way to 2019. Now they also object to 18F, which is a redacted photo from 2019. So Hunter has a crack pipe and it's redacted. And they say this came after he purchased the gun. So who cares? And it fails to show the location of where this was. It fails to show the crack pipe's owner. And it's also prejudicial, but they say no. Nope, sorry. It shows Hunter's device for smoking crack. So this is to show how he smoked it. It also shows the accuracy of his statement of his active addiction. Lasted all the way to 2019. We're also going to have in an expert witness, a special agent called Joshua Romig. He's going to opine that the pipe in the background of the photo is consistent with the device used to smoke crack cocaine. Now, they also want to get different portions of his book thrown out. They say no. These reasons that they're inadmissible, they say they're not relevant. Remember, Hunter wanted them to include a bunch of other statements from the books. So they're trying to include certain statements. Then Hunter said, okay, if you want to include statements of the book, how about I include my statements of the book and we can make a complete record. And so now they're saying, no, you don't need to add all of those things. The portions of the book, which Hunter wants to throw in are not relevant. What is his grief about the loss of his brother have to do with anything? That he was an addict because he lost his brother? It's just meant to be sympathetic. Fact is you were addicted when you said you were not. The fact is that he had periods in which he claims he was healthy, combative discussions, sloppy addled, all these other things. And none of these are relevant to any of the crimes charged here. And so none of these make the jury more likely, more easy, makes their job more easy with that information. Now, the government also responds to Hunter's request that the government create a summary chart, which the government already created. And so therefore this can be denied. We've already done that. And then lastly, on 38, there's a fight over this exhibit. Hunter objects to three photographs from witness two. He says there's 
there's no drug paraphernalia displayed, nothing in there that's relevant. And they say, no, that's wrong. Photograph at page seven does show drug paraphernalia to the right of the defendant in the top right. They say it's up there. You just missed it, morons. The government does not intend to use page 10, but with respect to page 11, the photograph is relevant as to location. Witness two will also testify that this was taken at a house in Malibu where she was with Hunter. So in conclusion, we ask you to overrule Hunter's objections and let us win. Signed by Derek Hines, Leo Weiss, the same guys, David Weiss, who all rigged the B original plea deal are now having to backpedal and bring this case forward. So that is what they submitted. And now let's jump into the actual activities of the trial. CNN is reporting that there's no cameras in the courtroom, but there's also no digital information that is being shared about. So this is how they are bringing us the news. They're literally transferring paper back and forth from inside the courtroom, which is about as locked down as we've ever seen anything. CNN's Paula Reed and every other journalist outside the Wilmington, Delaware Federal Courthouse must rely on handwritten notes delivered from inside to deliver real-time information to the public. Isn't that wild? Just as with the recent trial of Trump, there's no live video or audio available to the public, but this is even more limited than Trump's was. And we know why they limited Trump's trials, because they didn't want us to see what they were doing inside. Maybe that's the same thing here. But the Biden trial is even more limited than Trump's was. Here's this jury form. The criminal trial allowed no TV or audio, but reporters were at least allowed in that case to use email or Slack to communicate with the outside world. Neither option is available here. So we're relying on notes or runners or for reporters to come out of the courthouse and talk to us in person. It's crazy. They're literally running notes out. Here's what happened. Run it outside in America in another important trial where we're supposed to have transparency and accountability for what's happening. So that's how we're getting our news. Now we're back in court and it was a little bit of a curious morning today because we were missing some jurors and here is an update. They said one juror was dismissed from the Hunter Biden trial at the start of the day. They sent an email. They said, your honor, I live an hour away. This is so far from us for me. I just can't get there. So the judge entered the courtroom and says 855 says, well, okay, so we lost a juror. The judge said the juror sent an email explaining she lives in Milford, Delaware, an hour away from the court. She's unemployed. The judge said the juror did not realize they would be expected to be at the courthouse every day. She's like, what? Every day? I only came yesterday because my dad was off work. So that juror's gone. Now we figured it out. So here is where this goes. Trial starts for day two opening arguments. Government prosecutors who may or may not be actually trying in this trial. We have no idea. Ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't matter who you are or what your name is in opening arguments. Derek Hines for the government prosecutor. He said it's simply clear here. Hunter Biden was addicted to crack and he lied on a federal form about his addiction when buying a gun. Now we're here not because of some politics or something like that. No, we're here because of Hunter's lies and his choices. No one is above the law, they say. It doesn't matter who you are or what your name is. Now I get real tired of this stupid phrase, obviously, because tons of people are above the law and you can see it in this case. So prosecutor does that stupid phrase. Now they also showed a picture of Hunter's Colt revolver. They say, here's what this crackhead has done. They showed an image of hollow point ammunition as well. Biden's lawyers previously said in their filings that he never used or even loaded the gun when he had it for 11 days before his girlfriend threw it away in the dumpster so that kids could eliminate themselves. So here's the picture. This is a Colt Cobra 38 special revolver that he purchased from a gun store in Wilmington, Delaware. They submitted this nice little revolver there. Pictures showed during the opening statement. The prosecutor continues. And ladies and gentlemen, and as this evidence unfolds here today, you're going to hear from the man who sold the gun to Hunter, a man from the gun store where Hunter came and purchased this revolver some time ago. And he's going to explain to you the very form that Hunter filled out. Now we have to, you'll hear from him that a gun salesman has to rely on what they put on the form. A salesman doesn't have a crystal ball to determine what's true or what's false. And you're going to see this form. It's from the ATF. And we're going to show you the one that was filled out when Hunter bought the gun himself. And when he filled out that form, ladies and gentlemen, he lied on the form. Clear as day. The evidence will show. Now, Hunter also admitted all of this when he wrote his little book. Hunter wrote a memoir, ladies and gentlemen, and he described his addiction in the book himself. Using his own words, you're going to hear the defendant say that his superpower was finding crack anywhere, anytime. Those are Hunter's words, ladies and gentlemen. His, not mine. You'll hear it from him. Here, you're also going to see more evidence about these drugs to the jury. They're showing these pictures on his slide deck. These drugs came from Hunter's own electronic devices. And you're going to hear from expert witnesses who will authenticate those devices, show you where these photos came from, and show you what they are. Now, we also are going to show you text messages.
messages from Hunter. We're going to authenticate these too. Hunter knew that he was an addict, says the prosecutor. You're going to see text messages like this one, where Hunter was even calling himself a liar and a thief, where he admitted multiple times that he was a drug user. And listen to this, ladies and gentlemen. They played a portion of Hunter's audiobook, so they just heard Hunter's voice. So they're playing his voice. Sounds like his dad. Kind of like a crackhead. Kind of, yeah, I didn't do it. No, I didn't know. I really don't know. Was that your laptop? I don't know. Hines said during his opening statement, ladies and gentlemen, you're also going to hear from Hallie Biden, Hunter Biden's girlfriend, who found and threw away his guns because she was fearful for him. He was going to harm himself or harm somebody. You're going to hear that she was giving a, quote, grant of immunity to testify in this case about her own past. She's also a crackhead. The immunity requires Hallie Biden to testify truthfully. And by the way, I'm in favor of crackheads who are no longer crackheads, by the way. So hopefully she's no longer doing it. We don't know. Hines said Hallie Biden had been a drug user too. After we'll see if Hunter beats her up with that. Wow. And Hunter introduced crack cocaine to her. What a nice guy. Getting everyone else addicted with him. The worst. Hines said Hallie Biden, the government prosecutor said she was clean. She was trying to get sober. Hunter kept dragging her in and she found his gun, threw it out in October. And so now we've granted her immunity and she's going to come in and testify about Hunter. And here's what else you're going to hear. The jurors say that the jury is pretty diverse or the legal experts say that half of them are gun owners. Great. And have relatives in their families who own guns. About half of them or more have had drug addiction in their families. This is important. Yeah, it's a cross section of America, I'm sure, of Biden supporters. So that's great. So we're predicting a hung jury or an acquittal, to be honest. But here's prosecutor finally ends the opening statement. And that's actually going to be a good thing. If Hunter is acquitted or there's a hung jury on this, this no one's above the law crap in a case so obvious as this is just going to be laughable. It's going to wreck their narrative because it's just so ridiculous. So government prosecutor ends their statement. They say, ladies and gentlemen, you know, addiction may not be a choice. It's a tough situation out there. A lot of people are addicted because our society and culture are rotting. He didn't say that. That's what I would say. But buying a gun is his choice. And he decided to buy a gun. Now, Hunter here today isn't charged with possessing drugs. This isn't a drug case. We would not be here today if he was just a drug addict. Okay. We're here because he lied on a form. No one's above the law. And Hunter lied on a form. And the resulting cover up of this whole thing, in my opinion, was to rig the 2020 election. That's why this FBI covered the whole thing up. So this was just a the beginning of rigging an election. And Trump just got convicted of 34 felonies for this. So maximum penalties here. I don't care if the law is just or not. I don't care if the form's unconstitutional. Hunter broke the law. No one's above the law. Maximum penalty always. That's the new game. Wish it wasn't that way, but that's how it is. So here, they give us some analysis and now the defense is up. So defense attorney, Abby Lowell, he comes up. He says, ladies and gentlemen, the key phrase that we're going to be focusing on here today is knowingly. The question is whether Hunter Biden knowingly submitted that form knowing that it was fraudulent. And when you heard from the prosecutors who were just up here, you'll notice that they left out a word and that's a pretty key part of their case. And you'll also hear that out of the 11 days that Hunter possessed the firearm, it was only out of the lockbox on one day. All right, that's not good. That's, you're kind of coping on that one already. That's a cope, big time. And by the way, so maybe he did illegally possess a firearm and maybe illegally filled out the form, but he locked it up so it was safe, even if he was a crackhead. He just kind of made your admission there, Uh uh-oh. But ladies and gentlemen, they have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Hunter knowingly violated the law, which is a little strange way of phrasing it. So ignorance of the law is not an excuse. Okay, you know this just by getting a speeding ticket. You know what the speed limit is? No, I think it's 55. No, it's 35. You got a ticket for that. Well, I didn't know. Oh, you didn't know? Oh, well, now you do. Have a nice day. Back on the road. I don't care if you don't know. That's what the law law is. So he's actually saying something like, and I don't know if this is a direct quote or not, but it looks like it is. They're going to say that Hunter was too cracked out to know what he was signing, maybe. Is that the thesis? Even though voluntary intoxication is not a defense either. So let's go through this. They say Lowell traced Hunter's addiction back to various traumas that he experienced by showering with Joe also. I don't know. Beginning with the childhood car crash that killed his mom and left him with a brain injury, which is a terrible thing, by the way, and that's awful. But from there, is he entitled to be a crackhead for the rest of his life? No. And I think that the reason why I have such a problem with, and I don't buy his rejuvenation story, his return reclamation story, is because he's like a professional degenerate. This is what he does. This is his lifestyle. Some people are caught in an addiction. Some people are lifestyle addicts. That's just how they are. And there's no even real regret about it. That's why Hunter is sitting in his dunk tanks smoking crack at rehab centers because he doesn't care. Like literally millions of people in this country, Hunter has struggled with addiction. He has abused alcohol since he was a teenager and drugs since he was an adult. And I have a ton of sympathy for addiction. 
without going into my story, there's a lot there that I empathize with, but there's still cocaine showing up at the White House. Nobody really knows why that is. So until you see actual recovery from somebody, all their talk is just public person like this. It's just bloviation. It's just fake. So we're not buying it. Now, Hunter, the defense also suggests he wasn't even interested in buying a gun. He didn't even have much interest in that revolver. So he didn't even knowingly lie to the gun dealers. They say he just showed up into the gun store and the gun salesman led Hunter to the guns and they picked out a handgun for him. The salesman called Gordon Cleveland referred to himself as a whale hunter. Hunter was only in the area to buy a new phone from an AT&T store. And so he walked in and this guy was like, you better buy this gun, Hunter. You know you want it. Kind of like the first time Hunter tried crack, like his friend was putting pressure on him. There haven't been many references to former President Joe Biden in the defense's opening statements. They don't want to talk about him. But Abby Lowell didn't mention Hunter Biden drove his father's black Cadillac to the AT&T store on the day he bought the revolver. His father's black Cadillac. Was that the one he got out of the garage with all the classified documents? I don't know. Where it came from? Maybe there was some Ukraine memorandum in there. All right, so defense attorney Abby Lowell, he's continuing his opening statements. He said that, you know, prosecutors highlighted Hunter Biden's cash withdrawals and the president's son used cash for various things, including for rehab and probably for Grey Goose like Fannie Willis and her fanny pack under her mattress. Hunter Biden, who had no credit card at the time, according to his defense team, bought the firearm at the center of the case with cash. Prosecutors said that they would use text messages and the cash withdrawals to prove Hunter Biden was using drugs. That's what prosecutors said. So there's Abby Lowell. Hunter's attorney said he paid in cash all the time. Now, they also released the preliminary jury instructions. And I wanted to pause on this because this is pretty curious. Remember how long it took for us to get the jury instructions in the Trump trial? All we had to wait till the very end. And in fact, even at the very end, end, we've got questions about whether they were accurate, whether they were accurately read in court. So they were changing. All of the evidence was presented in the Trump trial. And then we got the jury instructions. And then the jurors were instructed on what the rules were after they heard all of the evidence. But what you'll see here in federal court is the jury instructions have dropped already. Here's the preliminary jury instructions subject to change. Now, we did not get any of this and the jurors did not get copies of this, but in the Trump trial in New York. Now, here is what we see. This is the nature of the indictment. So we at least know what the charges are now. This one is simple, right? False statement, material to a firearms sale. Two of those false records and defendant being in possession while being a drug user. The charges are contained in the indictment. It's the formal way, simply a description. It's only an accusation. And so consider it accordingly. Also gives us the presumption of all this stuff. The jury's going to get a hard copy of this. And this came out at the beginning of this, which is normal. And you'll also notice there's not a whole paint by numbers instruction manual, like from Ikea or something, instruction instructing the jurors on how to assemble the case. This is much more normal than what we see elsewhere. So the jury instructions are now out and they'll be expanded because those are just the preliminary instructions, but at least we have some idea. And in Trump's case, we had none. The jurors could pick a crime, any crime, whatever the hell they wanted, and they did. And we have notice, we have no unanimity amongst the predicate offense, and we have no notice about what to defend against because it could have been one of three defenses. And that is a due process problem. So we have the instructions, then, we get some more defense openings. So Abby Lowell continues. He tells the jury that the pouch the prosecutors say carried his gun had cocaine on it was actually used by Hallie. That pouch wasn't even Hunter's. Remember the pouch where the gun was in that they threw it away? There's also cocaine on it, residue. Lowell also said Hallie Biden put Hunter Biden's gun in the pouch before throwing it away near a grocery store. She did it. Five years later, Lowell said investigators tested a substance they say was on the pouch, but they did not test for fingerprints. And he says the gun was never even loaded anyways. It was never even carried around. So who cares? And the defense hunters defense finishes their opening arguments. The government is now done and opening arguments concluded. The judge says witnesses, prosecutors say the government calls FBI special agent Erica Jensen. She's an FBI agent who's going to be used to establish and introduce digital evidence, including the text messages and the Hunter Biden photos. Uh oh. So here's where this goes. They play video video clips from him. Hunter's looking down, detailing. His head is resting on his chin. First Lady Jill Biden and Hunter Biden's wife, Melissa Cohen, they've sat stoically during the book's reading. They're looking ahead to the FBI agent on the witness stand. Now, FBI agent Erica Jensen remains on the stand. They take a lunch break and we get some photos. Here's what Hunter looks like in the courtroom, taking his glasses off. We know how his plea deal fell apart because we covered all of that. The judge is Mary Ellen Norica. She called out both sides who were trying to
to rig a plea deal and have the court sign off on it. Before the lunch break, some of the jurors took notes during more intense periods of the reading of the audiobook. Hunter was describing his shame, his depravity. And many people who lost loved ones to addiction heard nearly an hour of Hunter narrating his book from the audiobook version. Do you think that they're going to have sympathy for him? Oh, why are we punishing an addict? Oh, gosh. So they're giving us an update. The FBI agent is still back on the stand. Jensen from the FBI, she's still testifying about how investigators corroborated Hunter's admissions of drug use. Her appearance also allowed prosecutors. They introduced portions of Biden's audiobook in as evidence. There's another photo of Hunter. There's his attorney, Abby, giving opening arguments. There is the FBI special agent, Erica Jensen, on the stand going through the audiobook. Where's Hunter? FBI special agent on the stand. Here's Jill, and that must also be Melissa Cohen Biden, who are in there. This is the woman who viciously verbally assaulted our friend Garrett Ziegler from Marco Polo USA. Oh, they also introduced this photograph. Cocaine. Oh, that's good. Yeah, there it is right there on display for the jurors to see. Here is another photograph. This looks like the prosecutor Hines showing us the form or a form. Biden, Robert Hunter Biden, Wilmington Court, born 1970. Check in the box. There's the judge looking over at the testimony and the jury. Here's another photograph of a speed loader, which was introduced, talked about today at trial. This is just a artist rendering, of course, of the photograph. Here's another one of the revolver. That's Hunter's illegal gun, which was foisted upon him by a maniac, Harvey Weinstein type of gun salesman, I guess. Take this gun. You're going to like it. So here's another one. Here's a rendering. You can see the jury. Looks like a full house packed to the brim there in Delaware. Looks like a bench conference happening here. Sidebar. Bunch of attorneys up at the bench with Judge Norica. We also continue. Now we're talking about the laptop. Uh-oh. Remember this? Prosecutors enter Hunter Biden's laptop as evidence. Oh, no. Remember the Mac shop? Prosecutors are now showing the laptop. FBI agent Erica Jensen testified that authorities verified the laptop belonged to Hunter Biden. Why? It's serial number and other records from Apple. Wow. FBI now admitting it. Yeah, they've already admitted it. We know. But why did they cover it up for so long? Huh. And when did they know? Was it before the 2020 election? Yes, it was. It sure as hell was. They knew all about it and they told all of us that we were lunatics. In fact, why didn't the FBI come back out and tell those 51 morons from the CIA that it was real? They wrote a letter. They all signed it. This is Putin, Russian disinformation, all the hallmarks of it because they tried and did steal an election. That was election interference enabled by the CIA. The FBI knew it was his laptop. We all knew it was his laptop. We knew it from the beginning. It looked real. New York Post broke the story. They got censored. FBI censored everybody over the story. Elvis Chan and others were doing war games with Facebook to censor all of us. The FBI and the CIA rigged the 2020 election by covering up the Hunter Biden laptop. That's just one mechanism. In previous court filings, prosecutors said that they'd use messages they found on the laptop to demonstrate that Hunter Biden was using crack cocaine in 2018, obviously, around the time when he bought the gun. They're introducing it now. Man, this Hunter should have taken that plea deal. So text messages now show that Hunter went through efforts to get drugs, how they got it. They're showing all this in court. So then they're showing text messages and we read through a lot of this, but text messages shown on Tuesday afternoon to the jury demonstrate Hunter Biden's efforts to get drugs and to meet with dealers. We read through a lot of these. He says, ASAP, if you can, can you come this way now? Someone says, you want 10 grams? According to the FBI agent testifying those messages were summer 2018 and they came from the laptop, which was absolutely real. So they also show invoices. They say, yeah, no, he was also in rehab. They showed invoices from a rehab facility in LA nearly a month before he purchased the gun. The invoice for care, including detox and a sober companion, ran several thousand dollars and spanned over a week in 2018. FBI agent also testified that Hunter wrote about this in his book. He said he relapsed two weeks after leaving rehab because this is what's just cycle for him repetitively and they just threw him in rehab time and again. He was doing crack and smoking and drinking white claws in rehab. FBI special agent Erica Jensen testified that investigators found the images on Hunter Biden's devices, which were subpoenaed in 2019, which they knew was real. And they covered it up all the way in 2020. Those devices included his iCloud backup as well as his laptop. Prosecutors say the pictures of drugs were exchanged between Hunter and some of his drug dealers in California. Hunter described in his memoir that depravity, that drug binges that dominated his time in LA that year. So here's some more picture of the crack. This might just be an artist rendering. 
laundering. I don't know. But here, prosecutors on Tuesday afternoon showed the jury photos of drugs they found on Hunter's devices. That's probably the real stuff there. They show a white substance that appears to be cocaine. We'll see what they testify to, as well as a scale often used to weigh the drugs. Looks pretty real to me. Here's another one. So they're going to testify about it. Here's the pictures of the drugs that they've shown on the screen. This is a photo from the U.S. Department of Justice that shows a white substance that appears to be cocaine. Maybe we'll get some experts to talk about it. ATF form at the center of Hunter Biden's allegations introduced this into evidence as well. So the form is now in. The ATF form that was filled out when Hunter bought the gun. Hunter's answer to 11E is, is the basis of two of the three charges against him. So here is the form and this is what it looks like. This is the actual form that Hunter signed that is now the subject of his criminal trial in Delaware because he lied on this very important document. Firearm transactions record from the U.S. Department of Justice ATF says you better follow the law on this. He filled it out. Lives in Newcastle. He says he is 6'1", 175 pounds, male born 1970, not Hispanic or Latino. Are you the actual buyer of the gun? Yeah, obviously we are. Hunter writes, and many of you, myself included, have filled out a form like this. Maybe this exact one, although I think it is revised now. So this one was revised October 2016. There is a 2023 form that is now out, so the numbers are a little bit different. But are you under indictment for a felony? No. Have you ever been convicted in court of a felony? No. Are you a fugitive? No. Are you an unlawful user? Uh-oh. Subsection E. Are you an unlawful user of, addicted to, marijuana, any depressant, stimulant, narcotic drug, or any other controlled substance, including crack marijuana accounts? Still illegal. Hunter. No. Right there. What? Illegal. Wrote in your autobiography that you're addicted to a lot. Have you ever been adjudicated as a mental defective? No. Has your father? Not yet. Any ever been discharged? Dishonorable conditions? Okay, you get the rest of it. Hunter signed this October 12th, 2018. So we have the date marked down. He verifies his ID with his passport and the name of the employee doing the check is Jason T. Here's what they're buying. Colt, Cobra, Revolver, 38 Special. This is from StarQuest Shooters and Survival Supply. This is the person who is transferring and in the sales department, this guy Gordon T. Cleveland scanned in and logged. So Hunter committed a crime when he filled out and signed that form. A lot of people say this form is illegal, unconstitutional. You should be able to sell and transact firearms without our federal government intervening in your free exchange of commerce. I understand all of that. And in another case, we would take that position aggressively. But here, no one's above the law. Hunter Biden lied on a federal form, and so he should go to prison for the maximum amount of time, just as everyone else is not above the law. So that's the form. Prosecutors say that he withdrew about 150 grand in cash over 2018. They say on an almost daily basis, Hunter was withdrawing hundreds, sometimes thousands of dollars in cash when he purchased the gun. Why do you think he bought the gun? Because he's going out and buying drugs, according to an FBI agent. On October 12th, the day Hunter bought the weapon, he withdrew five grand in cash, according to receipts. Prosecutors say he paid for the gun in cash that year from September to November, 150 grand in cash. Ooh, it's a lot. Now, FBI agents also say that he texted that he was smoking crack days after he bought the firearm. He texted, he says, I'm smoking crack. In one text the day after he bought the gun, Hunter said, quote, he was waiting for a dealer in his text messages. Now, then they get cross-examination. So FBI agent finishes up the direct exam. Abby Lowell for the defense now comes up. Prosecutors done questioning the FBI agent. We got a trove of Biden texts. We got a trove of Biden photos all going to the jury. Now, Biden's lawyers now start their cross-examination. They're questioning the authenticity of these. Well, where did these come from? Did you authenticate these? Did these come from Russia? Did Putin sign off on these? Prosecutors have shown several videos to the jury. They say, we got after subpoenaing the devices. One video showed a shirtless Hunter Biden holding what appeared to be a crack pipe. Another video showed a white substance on a scale. There's the photo. Oh no, there's nips. Hunter's nips. In an artist's rendering, we were doing everything we could to avoid it, but they showed up here in cartoon format. Prosecutors introduce a video of a shirtless Hunter Biden. Gross. Second day of the trial has now ended. We're done. The first and as of yet, the only witness, Erica Jensen, going to be back on the stand tomorrow for cross-examination. Court resuming 9 a.m. Eastern time on Wednesday, and of course, we'll be here to continue our coverage. Let's see what CBS said about this 
the day. We have this fella who was out front in Delaware. Tomorrow, our plan is to see if we can connect with Garrett Ziegler from Marco Polo, who's also there, to give us the real take. But for now, we'll see what CBS has to say about this on day two of the trial. Some of the most dynamic, potentially embarrassing testimony up top. Today is opening statements. We'll hear from the prosecution, the special counsel's team, and the defense. Then it's the first witness. It's an FBI special agent who'll talk about the text messages Hunter Biden sent through the course of 2018. The witness list, the way we read it, shows Hunter Biden's ex-wife next on the list. Below her, the widow of his late brother, Beau Biden. That's Hallie Biden, a woman with whom he also had a romantic relationship. The time frame hasn't really moved on this. They're still thinking one to two weeks, all of it here at the federal courthouse, and then potentially a verdict before June 14th. That's a week from Friday. Federal courthouses have their pluses and minuses. They are historic buildings. They are comfortable buildings, but there are prohibitions still on phones and computers. So the updates we give you are run out here on pieces of paper with notes we've jotted down and we telephone in. We will watch without our phones a historic first full day of trial here in Wilmington today. All right, so this that's what it looks like at the scene. Having a difficult time getting real accurate information, but trial is unfolding. And so far, it seems like there's a ton of evidence that's stacking up against Hunter. The question is, will it matter if the jury is on team Biden because of the jurisdiction? So we'll, of course, continue to cover this. Thanks for subscribing, my friends. We got Garrett Ziegler, who will be joining us at some point, hopefully tomorrow, to unpack what's happening in Delaware. And if you enjoyed this video, you're definitely going to like our next video, which is where we're jumping into what's happening in Florida, the classified documents case, and Congress's attempt to defund Jack Smith and the rest of Trump's political prosecutors. So we'll see you over there on that one.